Uh, I've been there almost five years now. So um, I started as a research assistant, just uh, testing on the project, um, and soon became much more involved in the network itself. So we collaborate with lots of different labs across the UK. We're actually sort of hub for autism research with baby siblings. Um, and now that's spread to the rest of Europe as well. We have about five or six labs that we collaborate with across Europe. We're also part of the um, uh, North American um, BSRC network as well. Um, and so it's great to help sort of coordinate all of those things. We are running a project uh, looking for early signs of autism and we've now branched out actually and we're looking at early signs of ADHD as well, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. What it involves our project is uh, families coming in who have a baby whose older brother or sister has a diagnosis of autism or ADHD. Uh, they come in from when they're as young as three months old and we follow them every sort of four to six months up until they turn three, which is the earliest age that children tend to get a diagnosis. Uh, the reason for that is that the diagnostic process actually relies on observing certain specific behaviours and some of these behaviours don't even become apparent until around that age. Um, so the reason our project is looking for early signs is obviously if we can find so-called biological markers of autism early, then we can hopefully diagnose earlier and actually support these children and their families earlier with interventions. So when a family comes in, they come in for the whole day and we run a whole battery of different tests. We do a lot of behavioural uh, tests. Um, in the later visits, in the toddler visits at two and three years of age, we do some of the actual clinical autism diagnostic assessments, for example, the ADOS. Um, and we interview the parents and get sort of an early developmental history. So we get quite a big picture of these children at that age. And that's what we basically form our research diagnosis on. Um, in the earlier visits, um, we do all sorts of things. We use eye tracking. Um, Obviously babies can't talk, they can't press buttons, yes or no, right or left, so we have to get as much information and data from them as we possibly can, so we have to use a whole range of techniques. Eye tracking is a very powerful one, it enables us to see exactly where on a screen a child's looking, um, so we can ask all sorts of questions using various studies like that. Um, we use uh, EEG, so electroencephalography, which measures the naturally occurring electrical activity on the surface of the scalp. So the babies wear these sort of elasticated hair nets on their heads um, while they're watching videos and we can see how they're reacting, how their brains are responding to um, the videos and things that they're watching. We also do live singing and things like that, see how they react to something sociable like that. We also collaborate with King, so the Institute of Psychiatry, and some of our babies do um, MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging as well, um, which is quite tricky, as you can imagine, with these young babies because uh, they basically have to sleep in the scanner. And I don't know if you've ever had an MRI, but they're quite noisy. <laughs> so um, that's quite a challenge in itself, getting the babies to sleep through the noise of the scanner. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, I can imagine. that's crazy. I didn't know that you could do that. But I, I've seen the, the net, obviously. Yes, the, and you might stuff. also have seen, we use a technique called um, NEARS, which is Near Infrared Spectroscopy, uh, which involves a baby's basically wearing a, a headband that has um, near infrared lights that um, are emitted basically just a tiny amount into the scalp. Um, and then are reflected back and picked up by receptors. And that's actually measuring the sort of level of oxygenation in the blood. So it's, it's the blood changes color depending on how active that area of the brain is. Um, so we also use that technique too. And one of our findings was using EEG. Um, we found when babies were watching videos uh, while wearing the EEG hairnet um, of faces either looking directly towards them or to the side, so shifting their gaze, um, we found differences in the way that the babies uh, who have an older brother or sister with autism and who actually then go on to get a diagnosis of autism, how they uh, responded to the faces looking directly at them. 
uh, they were effectively less responsive um, than neurotypical babies were, um, and less responsive than the babies who, although they may have had an older brother or sister with autism, didn't actually later go on to develop autism, which is quite an interesting, that's one of the earliest findings, at around six to eight months of age. Well, so, I mean, other things, so, f for example, our eye-tracking studies, uh, one of the very commonly held views is that um, a possible sort of precursor of autism is that they lack this sort of social interest um, and that that may have a sort of cascading effect and they won't be having eye contact with people, they won't be picking up on language cues and things like that. And actually, an interesting thing we found is that uh, one of our studies, which we call the face pop-out, uh, babies are shown using an eye tracker, um, an image, a static image that has various pictures, one of which is a face. And we find that with all babies, immediately they're drawn to the face. It's the pop out effect. You know, we are drawn to sort of social images. Um, and we had assumed and expected to find that the children who we then later gave a research diagnosis of autism to might not be as attracted to the faces, but actually they were, which is an interesting finding in itself. Well, obviously we have to make them as exciting and <laughs> intriguing for the babies and as fun as possible because otherwise we're going to get no data. <laughs> so uh, they do generally enjoy them, you know, they're very colourful, a lot of the videos are fun and we intersperse them with videos that they know and familiar with, Thomas the Tank Engine and In the Night Garden, things like that. Um, and, you know, silly noises that keep their attention. Um, we find bubbles come in very handy to keep them happy and, you know, generally distract them if we need to put the hairnet on or things like that. Um, but yeah, the families generally, the feed, well, the feedback's amazing that we get. The families really enjoy coming in. I think the babies get a lot out of it and they're actually quite sad to leave the project when they're three. Um, so uh, it's quite nice to have that feedback from the family. These people that get involved in these projects are just amazing, you know. Um, on our project as well, you know, the families that come in, the volunteer, it's a big commitment, you know, you're, we're seeing them for a long time over a period of three years um, and they come in for a whole day and, you know, devote a lot of time to it, so they're, they're pretty amazing. Obviously all the families that are part of our project already have a child who has a diagnosis of autism mm. um, and they now have a baby and you know, part of the reason for being of our project is obviously there is a huge genetic component to autism so they know before they even start that their baby is at a higher genetic risk so, you know it's it's you know in the general population it's about one percent of children who get a diagnosis for younger siblings of children already diagnosed it can be as high as about 20 percent so you know families coming in are aware of that generally not always but generally um, but you know they, it, it, there's a huge range I'd say it's quite difficult to get hold of families um, who have a child already diagnosed with autism and have continued to have more children. Um, you know, some of these families find it quite difficult depending on the severity of their child with autism. Um, so we are constantly looking for families um, in this position um, and uh, if anyone's interested, by all means get in touch with us. Um, we're, we're always happy to have new recruits. <laughs>